Hi, Steve Ellingson here with a lecture on frequency multiplication. First, the general idea. General idea simply is that we have some sinusoid or some narrowband modulated sinusoidal carrier, and it's at a frequency of omega naught. And what we desire is a copy of this thing, but which has been scaled up in frequency by a factor of n. So this is the frequency multiplier. And n, for the purposes of this talk, can be 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, pretty much any integer. And uh, non-integer values are certainly possible, but they're a special case, and usually that requires something like a phase-locked loop, which I'll probably mention several times in this lecture, but not part of the scope of this particular lecture. Applications for frequency multiplication occur when you need the sinusoid or a narrowband modulated sinusoid at a frequency which is too high to conveniently achieve using another method. For example, an LC oscillator or a DAC or something of that nature. Uh, other methods of frequency synthesis. So the idea is that you generate the signal at a low frequency and then you multiply in frequency to get to the desired frequency. So two applications of this. One, this is a method for generating FM, frequency modulation, at RF frequencies. And the idea is you could use the message signal as a control to a voltage-controlled oscillator, which generates FM, and then you could multiply frequency by N, and that would give you frequency modulation at the desired frequency. Another example is generation of LOs, that is a local oscillator signal. There you have an oscillator. It's convenient to generate this frequency at a relatively low frequency. You multiply by n to get whatever frequency you want, and now you're able to mix the baseband signal up to RF. So doing this much may be easier than generating the signal at the uh, uh, intended LO frequency directly. Here are some methods for frequency multiplication some of which I'll discuss in detail here and others which I will not. One is self-multiplication, that is multiplying the signal by itself. We'll see that that gives you n equals 2. In other words, that will double the frequency, but that's about all it will do. Another approach is to use a nonlinearity. There are many kinds of nonlinearity. One is square law nonlinearity, that gives you n equal 2 only. There is rectification, which will give you even values of n, and that includes half-wave and full-wave rectification. There's thresholding, which will give you odd values of n, and then clipping. So these are all methods that use some form of nonlinearity. Then once again, we have phase-locked loops, which is a method not addressed in these notes. Okay, so first, self-multiplication. Imagine some sinusoid, C times cosine omega naught T plus some phase. We simply make a copy of it, apply it to this thing, which is a multiplier. And uh, if you multiply a signal by itself, you just square it. So this is C squared cosine squared of the argument. We can use a trig identity to replace cosine squared with uh, something in terms of cosine of a different argument, in this case just multiplied by 2. We expand that out and we get this. So this is a DC term plus something which is at twice the original frequency. So if we filter away the DC term, then we're left with just this thing which is at twice the frequency. So that's an n equal 2 frequency multiplication operation. So some comments here. First, the multiplier, the thing I'm showing using this symbol, is uh, hard to implement as a literal multiplier. At low frequencies, uh, below RF, it's not difficult. It's not straightforward either, but, but it's not out of the question. At RF frequencies, this becomes much more difficult. It can be done, but it may not be your first choice. At RF frequencies, the more common way to do this as opposed to implementing a literal multiplier, is to instead implement the multiplier as a mixer. Now, mixers introduce some complexity that makes this approach 
uh, less attractive for a bunch of reasons. So self-multiplication for RF frequency multiplication is not common. It's done, but it's not as common as the other methods I'm going to show you here. The next broad class of methods involve nonlinearities. And the idea is we apply a signal at a frequency omega naught, we subject it to some nonlinearity, and uh, possible nonlinearities include square law, rectification, thresholding, and clipping. That results in a waveform with lots of harmonics. So that's the way that all these other frequencies get generated. We use a bandpass filter to pick off one of those frequencies, uh, the one at um, the desired value of n, and that's how it works. So what I'm about to talk about is the various ways, the various nonlinearities that you can use in such a scheme. First, the square law method. The square law method is typically implemented using a diode or a transistor whose response voltage or current, I'm going to call that Y, is approximately proportional to the applied voltage or current squared. So X of t, the applied voltage or current, results in a response of y of t, which is approximately squared. So if everything goes according to plans, this is self-multiplication, and as a result, you get a signal at twice the original frequency, as mentioned earlier. In practice, this doesn't work exactly like that, and that's because any practical device, any practical diode, any practical transistor, will not be exactly a square law device, but instead will give you something in this form. That is the form of a Taylor series. So in this Taylor series, we get terms associated with each of the possible harmonics. For example, this term is seen to be the fundamental. This term is seen to be the desired second harmonic. This term is seen to be an undesired third harmonic, and so on for each of the other terms in this Taylor series. Note also that this depends on the operating point of the device. So here x naught is indicated as the operating point of the device, and coefficients are determined by the operating point. If you change the operating point, the coefficients change and then the relative magnitudes of the harmonics change, so this can be complicated. So in summary, this is commonly used for n equals 2. The square law device is ideally a device that produces a second harmonic, but it's a bit of a hassle to set the operating point. Again, commonly done for n equals 2, it's just this is the issue, that you have to be careful about how it is biased so that you know how this expression is going to work out and that the resulting products are things that you can either retain or filter as necessary. There are two types of rectification that we can address. One is half-wave rectification. The idea is very simple. Given a sinusoid, you run it across something which rectifies, like a diode, which passes current only in one direction. And if you hit that diode hard enough, it'll either be turned on, resulting in the half pulses you see here, or it'll be turned off, associated with the negative going part of the sinusoid. So what you see is this train of half pulses. I should note that this can also be done with a Class C amplifier, if you're familiar with these things. Class C amplifier can similarly be used for half-wave rectification. So the nice thing about this approach compared to the square law approach is it does not require biasing, so it's not sensitive to operating point, but it does require a signal which is big enough to turn the device fully on and fully off. So the signal you apply to this thing is going to have to be big enough so that the transistor or diode is fully turned on for half the period and fully turned off for half the period. Something you should know is that this generates strong fundamental output. The output is dominated by a term in the Fourier series which is associated with omega naught. So you get that omega naught term and it's strong in this, in addition to all the other harmonics, one of which you're going to want. Produces strong n equals 2 and also produces uh, even harmonics uh, which are proportional to 1 over n squared uh, minus 1. Odd harmonics are relatively weak, uh, nominally 0 depending on how precise this rectification is. 
In full wave rectification, we take that sinusoid and we end up with these half pulses on every half period. Recall for half wave rectification, we had pulses only uh, once a period. Now we have pulses on every half period. So the way we get that, just one of the many ways to get that I should point out, is you start off with a transformer and there's a diode attached to each end of the other side of this transformer. So what happens for one half of a cycle, current flows this way, this diode turns on, and this diode is off, which gives you a pulse associated with each of the positive going halves of the sinusoid. For the other half period, the current flows through this loop like so, so this diode is turned on and this one is turned off. So that gives you a half pulse associated with each of the negative going portions of the input waveform. Now these are combined, so you end up with all the half pulses you've generated, so you get a half pulse every half period. Like half wave rectification, this does not require biasing, not sensitive to operating points, but again, it does require a signal big enough to turn the devices, that is the diodes here, fully on and fully off. Unlike half wave rectification, the fundamental is fully suppressed. So that's one less thing that you have to filter out of the output, and that's definitely a pro for this method. You get a strong n equal two, second harmonic that is. Other even harmonics are also present, and they're proportional to one over n squared minus one. But an additional pro is that they're, they're twice as large than what you get with half wave rectification. And then, once again, weak or nominally zero odd harmonics. So this is probably not the thing to use if you want odd harmonics, like 3, 5, and so on. In the thresholding method, we apply that sinusoid to a transistor switch. And that transistor switch is a switch, not an amplifier. So the idea is it tries to turn on for half the period and it tries to turn off for roughly half the period. And that results in this thing, which I'm calling a sloppy pulse train. In other words, it might be kind of like a square wave, but it's kind of sloppy because we generated it using an analog switch. And often what's done is you clean that up using logic gates. So here I'm showing two not gates, but it could be any logic that has an output frequency which is the same as the input frequency, and such a thing can result in a near ideal square wave. So some methods stop here, other methods do this, uh, or aim to achieve this. First, let me note that this is an active method, so this requires power, because the switch has to be powered and the logic gates have to be powered. If you are able to generate something like an ideal square wave, and by that I mean something that has a duty cycle of 50% in addition to having sharp edges, that will give you strong odd order harmonics. Also, the magnitude of these harmonics goes as one over n. You will recall that the rectification methods gave you harmonics which are proportional to uh, one over n squared minus one. So this is a great way to get odd high order harmonics, uh, three, five, and so on. To the extent that your output is a sloppy pulse train, you get all the harmonics. Uh, and the magnitude depends on the duty cycle, and usually this isn't the preferred approach because if you have all the harmonics, that means the spacing between your desired harmonic and an undesired harmonic is half as much. Much nicer, typically, to have a scheme which generates either or primarily evens or primarily odds. That makes them easier to isolate. In the clipping method, we apply a sinusoid to a nonlinear amplifier, typically a class C amplifier. And the output looks either something like this, where the bottom fraction of the waveform is clipped, or something like this, where the top fraction of the waveform is clipped. This generates all harmonics, like the uh, sloppy pulse train, but the magnitude of those harmonics falls off relatively fast, similarly to the way that the harmonics roll off in the rectification approaches. So this is primarily used for frequency doublers or triplers. 
It's harder to use this for higher frequency harmonics because higher order harmonics get weak much faster. So finally, a summary of frequency multiplication. There are many methods. Furthermore, there are many variants of the methods that I've shown you, and there's many combinations of methods that are used commonly. The selection of the method for your particular application depends on a number of considerations. For example, is n even or odd? We've seen some methods are better for even, some are better for odd. Is n small, like 2, or is it large, like 5 or 10? That may determine your choice of method. Is it hard or easy to filter the undesired harmonics? So whatever method you propose as a candidate method, you need to consider how easy or hard it's going to be to get rid of all the other harmonics being generated by this method. You need to consider whether the input signal is small or large. Some of these methods require devices to operate as switches. And that's usually easier if the input signal is large. If that's not possible, then you need to consider a method where the input signal can be smaller. For example, the clipping method. Then finally, power consumption. Some of these methods are passive, like the rectification approaches I showed. Other methods definitely require power, such as the thresholding method I showed. And then once again, I'll mention that PLLs frequently show up in this business. I would refer to that as the Cadillac of frequency multiplication. Without saying more about the method, that lets you select n to be any rational number. So n can be 1 half, that is 3 divided by 2, or you could have 31 divided by 64, which is slightly less than 1 half. So this is a way to get those non-integer values of n. That concludes this lecture on frequency multiplication.